in charge of Master in Environmental Science, which is a program for undergraduates. And a good bit of the work that I'm going to talk about today um, is actually based on work that we collaborated with those students. We could not have done it without the students uh, uh, to help us out. So, um, so what you're looking at here is all the south facing coastal ponds in Falmouth. Uh, they are all impaired by excess nutrients and under state mandate to remove those nutrients uh, and achieve certain total maximum daily load levels uh, and exactly how we're going to get there is the question I wanted to uh, touch on tonight. Permeable reactive barriers are part of that solution. Um, and, uh, you know, when I first started this work, uh, I was very excited. We got kind of shockingly uh, good removal rates in our POB that's right out here. And I took that uh, information to the wastewater superintendent in Falmouth. And he looked at me and said, well, you know, this, the state DEP doesn't recognize this. This is not a regulatorily approved uh, method of getting rid of nutrients. And we didn't get very far. So, but I think there has been some progress since. Um, so uh, to start with, I wanna just address some of the basics. Uh, nitrogen is a key constituent of us. Uh, you see here DNA molecule, some chlorophyll molecules, and all of the little red circles are around nitrogen atoms in those molecules. Um, and so we need to, to understand how the PRB works, we need to kind of go through the nitrogen cycle. Uh, so this is a simplified version of the nitrogen cycle. And uh, for purposes of this talk, we can think about nitrogen having two fundamental forms, reactive nitrogen, which includes compounds like organic nitrogen, proteins, peptides, inorganic nitrogen, nitrate, ammonia, uh, but not N2 in the atmosphere. N2 in the atmosphere is fairly unreactive. And of course, there's a lot of N2 in the atmosphere, 3.9 billion million metric tons compared to about 200,000 million metric tons of reactive nitrogen uh, in terrestrial systems. And so I've got a box here that represents the terrestrial system and I want to talk about some of the transformations that nitrogen undergoes in a typical ecosystem like this. So we can start with our organic N, represented here by my bunny. And these bunnies produce waste, just like us. And that waste decomposes to inorganic form, ammonia. And that ammonia can then be taken up by plants. And of course, that's the fundamental issue here. It's a nutrient that supports plant growth. And if we get too much of it, then we have too much plant growth. Um, that ammonia can also, in the presence of oxygen, undergo what's called nitrification. There's a number of microbes that do this, and they convert the ammonia to nitrite and then nitrate. So NO2 for nitrite, NO3 for nitrate. And that nitrate can then be also taken up by plants. And so this is a recycling pathway. Nothing has, no new nitrogen has entered the system. No nitrogen has left the system, right? Um, to get new nitrogen into the system, there are some microbes, which some of which are symbionts on plant roots, and some of which are like cyanobacteria that are capable of taking that so-called unreactive nitrogen in the atmosphere and converting it to reactive nitrogen. We call that process end fixation. Uh, and that's how we get new nutrients into these ecosystems. And if there were no countervailing uh, pathway to get nutrients, nitrogen out of the system, we'd be up to our ears in nitrogen. So there's a process called denitrification. Denitrification occurs in the absence of oxygen when the microbes that do this use the nitrate as an oxidant for their sugars, much like we use oxygen when we breathe to burn sugars and respire. And so they convert the sugars to CO2 and they convert the nitrate in that process to add back to N2 gas or unreacted form. Now, 
Back in 1913, Fritz Haber invented an industrial technique for converting N2 to reactive nitrogen, to ammonia, which has been important in, in allowing us to manufacture enough fertilizer to sustain the crop yields we need to support our population. So what you see on this graph on the, uh, your left is the Earth's population. It's going from 1850 under 2 billion to up to 6 billion in the 1990s. Now I think 8 billion. Uh, and on the right-hand axis, you see the millions of metric tons per year uh, of nitrogen being fixed by industrial processes of fertilizer production, by crop fixation, because we cultivate things like peanuts and legumes that are actually naturally fixed, they have those root symbionts, and by fossil fuel combustion. And when you add that all up, we're up over 150 million metric tons per year. How does that compare with the natural rate of end fixation that occurs on land? Well, it's equal to that or exceeds it. So we have doubled the inputs <laughs> of new nitrogen or reactive nitrogen, if you will, to ecosystems around the globe. And that, of course, is the fundamental problem because all that food that is produced is eaten and ends up in our waste. So in this series of photos, you can see what happened to seacoast shores in 1938, undeveloped, post-war, began to be developed today, over a thousand homes. All of those homes are on individual on-site septic systems. And I know Ray Jack knows this well. Uh, so each year we get about a meter of rainfall on the Cape, about half of that evaporates, about half recharges into the aquifer and flows to the shore and it entrains the plumes from these septic systems which enter Wakoit Bay and degrade the water quality. And nobody likes that, so this guy's gonna sail away. And this is sometimes the result. This is a massive, uh, mat of macroalgae uh, right out here in, in Kuwait in front of the reserve that uh, photosynthesized so much on the bottom of the bay that it actually formed oxygen bubbles, floated to the surface and blew into shore where it then decomposed. So you can see, this is the edge of the beach. This is a lot of algae. Uh, we don't see this very often, but basically this algae has replaced the natural eelgrass community that used to be here. Uh, and with that has come a host of changes to the ecosystem. Not gone unnoticed, back in 2010, an article appeared in the New York Times, 2023, there's still articles appearing in the New York Times about the problem on the Cape. Progress to fix the problem has been slow. And that of course is because it's very costly. So one solution, uh, one that is being implemented is to take our wastewater up to a wastewater treatment plant, plant, an advanced centralized wastewater treatment plant, where it will enter what's called a sequencing batch reactor. This is true for the Falmouth water treatment facility. It's a pretty, pretty good uh, cartoon of what it looks like, actually. Two sequencing batch reactors. What they do is they alternate between aerobic and anaerobic conditions. And in the process, they promote this denitrification process, this, this removal of nitrogen. And they're pretty effective. They can take uh, wastewater that might come in with a concentration of 30 or 40 milligrams per liter and reduce it to three milligrams per liter. So then that water is released back into the environment. Uh, and we're doing this, uh, in Little Pond, we have recently done this in Little Pond, where uh, at a cost of about $44 million, we've hooked up 1,400 homes uh, to the uh, Falmouth Wastewater Treatment Plant, which is in the watershed of West Falmouth Harbor. So we're moving that wastewater to West Falmouth Harbor uh, watershed. Now, uh, has it been effective? Well, we wanted to look at that. So uh, in 2015, 
we, before this plant was completed, we began installing a network of monitoring, groundwater monitoring wells around the pond. And you can see them here numbered LP1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth, 12 locations along the perimeter of the pond. And at the same time, homes began to hook up to the wastewater treatment uh, facility from Little Pond. It took a couple of years for all 1,400 or so homes to uh, hook up. Uh, we thought there might be some lag in the response because groundwater, you know, those plumes that are coming from everyone's septic system have to travel in the groundwater for some distance. And so it might take a couple of years, even, even a decade for us to see a difference at the shore. And that was really the question that we wanted to address with this work. Uh, the, each of these wells has samples three to five depths, so a total of about 42 samples each time we went out. And each of these dash lines represents a time that we've gone out to sample uh, that network of wells. And here's what the data look like. So we are indeed seeing a very significant decline. Um, so what you see here on the, again, on the left uh, hand side is the nitrogen concentration uh, in micromoles. If you're more used to thinking about it in milligrams per liter, you can look on the right hand side and see the scale. Uh, the blue line represents the reduction in nitrate. The red line represents total nitrogen. So this offset, this difference is actually due to the uh, presence of ammonia that's also in, that, in some of that groundwater. Okay, and that hasn't declined. The ammonia levels have stayed kind of the same. Um, but clearly, uh, we're having a good effect there in Little Pond. And what we don't know yet is how the ecosystem of Little Pond is going to respond to that nutrient reduction. That could take some time. Um, that water then goes to West Falmouth. It's going to flow, hopefully not into West Falmouth Harbor. It depends on the location of the infiltration beds in this parcel here, which represents the uh, property owned as part of the Falmouth Wastewater Treatment Plant. But the prior um, wastewater that was collected from downtown Falmouth and from Woods Hole has entered West Falmouth Harbor and is impacting that. Um, so that's a concern, and we, we can't keep loading more and more wastewater over to the West Fal to the Falmouth Wastewater Treatment Facility and keep loading it in to someone else's estuary. That's a problem. And in fact, we have quite a few more projects that are on the docket here as time goes on. So uh, this is a little harbor, the green blotch there. Um, you can see Great Pond, some work on uh, Bourne's Pond, and then of course, uh, Seacoast Shores and McCoy need to be attended to as well. So this is currently what the thinking is that all of these areas south of Route 28 will ultimately be placed on a sewer. They're densely developed. Uh, it makes economic sense to hook them up. So that's gonna require further treatment plan upgrades. And then, as I already alluded, the question of where that effluent will go. There is now thinking that perhaps we should consider an outfall, an outfall that could take tertiary treated water, not secondarily treated water, but tertiary treated. So that three milligram per liter, not 35 milligram per liter nutrient level water and put it out into Vineyard Sound. More study will need to be done to determine, you know, if that's really a good idea. Uh, and the cost here is not insubstantial, a couple hundred million dollars. So the question uh, that, that I wanted to address here is, could permeable reactive barriers be part of the solution? Would, would they potentially uh, be cheaper? Would they potentially be as effective or more effective in some, in some circumstances? So the, another important thing, and this goes back to that nitrogen cycle I showed you that you need to think about is the form of nitrogen matters. Denitrification only removes nitrate. It does not remove organic N, it does dissolve organic N, it does not remove ammonia. 
unless you can convert that ammonia to nitrate. But fortunately, most of the nitrogen, uh, inorganic nitrogen that's in our groundwater is as nitrate. And that's because this nitrification process occurs naturally in unsaturated soils. So uh, when your septic system leaches down water, it's passing, that's why you need to have that four foot separation uh, between the water table and the bottom of your leach field uh, to get that nitrification to occur. Uh, and so that converts that inorganic ammonia to nitrate once it's nitrate, it's very mobile in the groundwater. It does not absorb uh, to the groundwater, to the uh, sediments or the soils. And on the Cape, we have a very sandy aquifer, not a lot of organic matter down there. So there's not much metabolism going on. So it, again, remains undecomposed. We need to add carbon to promote that denitrification. And wood chips are a ready source of carbon. They're cheap and they're plentiful. This is a photo taken at the Wareham Wastewater Treatment Facility, which accepts all of the wood chips from Eversource as they go around chopping off all your trees to make sure that the limbs don't fall down and uh, disrupt power. Doesn't seem to be working that great. Um, so lots of wood chips available. And the idea would be that we will place these wood chips in a trench or in a column somewhere, up gradient of the uh, seepage base at the estuary to intercept that nitrate laden water and foster that denitrification. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so obviously, uh, if effective, if this worked, it would capture sources of nitrate, not just from wastewater, but also from rainwater, from which does have nitrate in it, from fertilizers. So that's an advantage if we wanna reduce nutrient loading into these ponds, we're capturing nitrate from all sources. Uh, if it's placed at the shore or near the shore, you wouldn't have this legacy of nitrate that will continue to flow out even after the sewer was in place uh, because we'll intercept uh, that water just before it enters the estuary. Uh, no water is moved between watersheds. We don't have the issue of taking Little Pond's water and moving it to West Fountain. And it could be cheaper to build. It, certainly is cheaper to operate because once it's in place, it operates passively. You don't need an operator, you don't need staff, you don't, there's no pumps uh, to go, you know, to break and so forth. So to test this idea, uh, back in 2005, we installed two test barriers, one uh, at a private homeowner's uh, property along the shores of Giles River, very generous individual that let us dig up his beach, uh, and another at uh, just here outside the reserve. Uh, the reserve barrier, well, the Childs River barrier is about 12 meters long, uh, about two meters wide, and about a meter and a half deep. And we just went down to the beach for the backhoe and dug it up. When we were done, we obviously, this is a subsurface barrier, so about, we have about a half a meter of sand on top of it. Uh, we put a little layer of geotextile cloth over it. You don't even know it's there. Uh, and then the one in, at what point here was 20 meters long, about 3.7 3 meters uh, wide, and about two meters deep. Yep. That's, I'm going to come to that later. That's a very prescient question. So just be patient and you will find out. Um, so, and then to, to determine if it's working, uh, there's sort of two strategies we used to sample. One was to put in a series of multi <laughs> sampling wells from the up gradient side across the barrier, perpendicular to the beach, uh, and then down there. So we could sample at multiple depths, cross section of the beach, if you will. The other is to walk along the edge of the beach 
so what we call the seepage phase, where most of the groundwater kind of seeps in uh, with a hollow rod that has some perforations in it and simply suck up water at multiple sites. So we call that a well point sampler. Um, and we're able to do that down gradient from the barrier and in an adjacent control area where there's no barrier. So in cross section uh, here, you can see a depth on the left axis in meters. Uh, this orange box represents the lo approximate location of the barrier. And uh, each of these vertical lines represents our wells. The little dots are sampling depths, sampling points. And then relative distance uh, in meters horizontally along the bottom axis. So the water flowing towards the beach is about 50% saturated in oxygen. The scale is up here. And once it encounters the region that's impacted by the barrier, and this is done almost immediately after we installed the barrier, uh, that, that oxygen was depleted because there's a lot of, again, organic matter decomposing first aerobically and then anaerobically uh, without oxygen. And the primary pathway we were interested in, that's anaerobic, of course, is denitrification, the removal of that nitrate. Uh, now you have to think about this water as moving with the tide backwards and forwards and up and down. So the area influenced by the, by the barrier is actually larger than the barrier itself, especially at the beginning when there's a lot of dissolved organic material coming off that wood. Uh, and then this is what happened to the nitrate flume. When it encountered that anaerobic water, that nitrate, which was coming in in the core of that flume at about 150 micromolar or about two milligrams per liter, totally disappeared to virtually undetectable levels. Now, walking along the beach, taking my well point sample, uh, here's an area where the barrier, this again is horizontal distance, concentration, it's time in micromoles. I know that's not a familiar unit for many of you, but uh, there's 70 micromoles in a milligram per liter, 70 micromoles per liter in a milligram per liter. So if that helps. So here's the barrier in the Charles River site. <laughs> levels ranged from 100 to virtually zero in the middle of the barrier and then up a little. So it looked like a creeping around the edge maybe. We were still getting some nitrate, but they were very high adjacent to the barrier, six to 700 uh, micromolar, almost to the drinking water uh, limit, which at that time was 10 milligrams per liter. Um, this scale is a log scale, which means we go from 0.1 to 1 to 10 to 100 to 1,000 uh, micromoles. This is in McQuoit, where the barrier is, we are at or under one micromole, or 1 70th of a milligram per liter. We're somewhere between 10 and 130 micromoles uh, outside the barrier. The most Dramatic evidence that this thing worked was a photo that Chris Weidman, who at that time was the research coordinator here, took one June day. And every June there was a bloom of this sort of, uh, I think it's largely ova, algae at the shore where all that nutrient rich water is percolating out at the seepage face. So this is low tide. Our barrier was placed right here where all that vegetation has been removed. So this was, Taken in 2009, it's now almost totally revegetated. But even in 2009, you can see no evidence on the surface that the barrier is there, right? Uh, but there is evidence here in the seepage zone because there is not enough nutrient to support the growth of that algae. And I did not, I promise, I did not go out there and pluck all the algae out for this photo. <laughs> Okay, so someone asked, how long will it last? Well, there's no way to test that except wait, but fortunately, it's now 2000, what is it, 23? Um, so the first experiment to test this, we did uh, again with a student in the semester of environmental science, Allison Tucker, 
went out and excavated wood from the barrier, put it in some columns, and we upflowed about three milligrams per liter, 250 micromolar nitrate. Uh, and this is what the data looked like. So what's shown here again is the cumulative mass over the period of 120 hours where this experiment was being, where the data was being taken uh, of nitrate that entered the columns. And that is the blue dots or these lines that basically go up in each of these graphs. And each of these graphs represents one core. In this case, 10 year old wood chips from the Childs River and another replicate of 10 year old wood chips from the Child River. So two cores from the Childs, two from McCoy, 10 year old, 10 year old, and two containing fresh wood chips, okay? Uh, what you see in the orange coated line, the orange symboled line, and in the green triangles, those two lines are uh, the concentrations measured at the 36 centimeter port and the top. And it took about 24 hours for water to flow the two feet up this column because we were flowing that water at about a foot per day, which is what we generally think of as, uh, as the travel time for groundwater on the Cape. So complete removal. No difference between fresh and 10 year old wood chips at this point. Uh, a question a number of folks raised was, well, how do you know the nitrogen isn't just being absorbed to the wood? How can you prove it's denitrification? And of course, the way to prove that is to look at how much of it is converted to, nit to N2, to atmospheric nitrogen. Uh, fortunately, we have some instrumentation and expertise at the MBL to look at that. And so we took samples uh, up these cores uh, of both the, and this is a case, this one shows uh, the data for the fresh wood chips, uh, of both the change in nitrate concentration as we went uh, flowed upwards and the accumulation of N2 gas. And they match almost perfectly quantitative conversion of nitrate to N2. So that was, again, very encouraging. So let's fast forward another five years um, to uh, the Wareham Wastewater Treatment Facility, where they are thinking about possibly using wood chips to uh, polish their effluent and achieve further nutrient reduction. So, you know, that would not be a PRB type use, it would be a bioreactor type use. Um, so Guy Campina, who's the plant operator there, uh, superintendent said, come on up, let's try this. Uh, again, we dug up wood chips from the, from the barrier. It's become a great resource out here for old wood chips, if you wanna know how old your wood chips are. Um, and this is some of the, the data. Again, similar, a little more, we got a little more sophisticated in five years. These are, these are our columns now, they're, they're bigger. Uh, they have more ports enabling us to uh, get a, a finer resolution on the, on the reductions with flow rates. We can control the flow rates. We can even control the temperature in the bioreactor system. Um, and we added 12 milligrams per liter. And then we have new wood three, three bioreactors, so we can get some replication, uh, and old wood, three bioreactors. And this is just, again, di travel time, or distance rather, which we could convert to time. If we know sort of the porosity, how much pore space there is, pump rate, we can get time. Um, and you can see that there's been some diminution in the rate of uh, nitrogen removal green line here represents nitrate. The orange line is total dissolved nitrogen, which includes ammonia component. Here's some ammonia. And it also includes some organic N, okay, which is not touched by these things. We do not remove the organic N. There's actually some production of ammonia as you move up in the old wood, but it's very minor. 
So if you take all that data and then we do experiments at two different temperatures and look at what the temperature response of this whole process is uh, and convert it to time, we can look at time in the bioreactor versus old wood, new wood, and fit decay curves to that data and get some information that could be used to engineer these things. And that, that was the goal here. Uh, if we compare the results of this work, and again, I'm showing you concentrations, two axes, one is in milligrams, one is in micromoles, so I can keep everyone happy, engineers, scientists. Um, this is our data from that experiment compared with data from 26 other studies that were compiled by Kelly Addy at the, in Rhode Island. Uh, this data appeared in the Journal of uh, Environmental Quality. And uh, one thing that came out of this is the temperature risk. So her data is a bunch of independent studies, different wood, different barriers, different beds, reactor beds. And from that, she got what they call a Q10 or, or temperature response of about two. Our data is about double that, four, much higher temperature reactivity but we have controlled for everything. This is the exact same wood at, in the exact same chamber measured at 16 degrees and 27 degrees. And this is old wood again, and this is new wood. So uh, one thing we've discovered is this is a very temperature sensitive process. Some people at Stanford done similar studies just recently published found exactly the same thing, almost exactly the same Q10 value. So I want to, at this point, just say thank you to all the uh, students and collaborators that we've had on this project and funders as well. Uh, and let's see where we are on time here. I'm good. Okay. So I do have, uh, want to go on and, yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's set, take a couple of questions if there are. Some. Okay. Yeah, it, it is, but when it approaches the shore, it's flowing to the shore, it's underlain by salt water. Okay, so you've got this dense salt water, so that water is flowing to the shore. It's very deep if you go further up into the you know, landward, but as you approach the shore, it's deflected upward by this underlying dense salt water and the release of overlying uh, burden of, of uh, land and. Well, so the question of how to get deep enough is, that's a really good segue uh, into the next part of the talk, because one of the criticisms of this is how do you get these wood chips to death? If we want to, we, you know, we're not going to dig up everyone's shoreline. We never get Conservation Commission to let us do that. Um, I don't know how we got them to let us do this, but did we do? Um, so, People have thought about, well, how can we get carbon to depth? And to engineer to the technical issues associated with getting wood chips to depth are pretty significant. Uh, however, it might be possible to dig, to sort of put in large boreholes, you know, as if you were drilling a big well, big water supply well, you can get a borehole that big uh, and fill a bunch of them and create a matrix, but no one's tried that yet. Uh, but what you can do is inject a liquid carbon source. And so people have gone to emulsified vegetable oil. So this is how that works. What a great question. Uh, this is uh, uh, a uh, cartoon showing, you know, homes further from the shore that have deeper flow because as this water is flowing to the shore, remember more water is recharging on top. And so it's depressing that water that started out some distance away, look, you know, moving it downwards. But once it gets close to the shore, it starts deflecting upward again. Uh, at least that's sort of the classic view of groundwater flow. There can be some underflow, that can happen. Um, and what's shown here is a, a tanker truck supposedly injecting uh, this emulsified vegetable oil, which then coats the sediment grains. Maybe it flows a little ways down towards the ocean, 
towards the receiving waters, but supposed to basically stick to the grains, supply this carbon source, and uh, achieve exactly the same thing, denitrification. So there have been now three projects that I'm aware of on the Cape that are attempting this. One is in Orleans, another in Falmouth, which was being led by uh, uh, Matt Charette at the Oceanographic Institution, and another on Martha's Vineyard. And there's a PRB working group that is addressing this issue and trying to come up with actual design plans for how you would, uh, how you would do this successfully at more locations. Um, so here's what the, yes, sure. Um, Lombardo is up in Boulder now. Are those the treated wood chips that are used in the nitrate systems or just plain old yeah. wood chips? So the only, the only reason they called them nitrex <laughs> was because they added a, a line. I mean, I think, you know, I just peeled contact me today. Um, you, know the, you know the secret formula? There is, yeah, there really was. When we put those in here, Lombardo was involved, so was Will Robertson. Those were the guys that were early adopters of this. Will really came up with the idea. Um, University of Waterloo in Canada. Uh, we blew in some Plato wood chips. We took a couple of bags of lime, sprinkled them over to control pH, blew in some more wood chips, more lime. Voila, you have nitrex. But nitrex we can patent. <laughs> Just again, I, I got another question for you. Are you monitoring uh, George Whitefelder's layer cake? I, I am not. That there were people at uh, the Mass Test Center uh, have monitored it. And it's supposedly doing the same thing. It does similar things. I think George is finding there are some problems with it, but there is a nitro E system or nitro system that's been developed on the vineyard by an engineer um, that is using wood as well. And they're having quite a bit of success with that. Can you just explain what that is? It's, I can't because he's, it's his system and I, I haven't seen one. I haven't, but I assume there's basically two components, a nitrification component and a denitrification yeah. component. Yeah. And so whether they recirculate or how, you know, how they... Putting that over the, uh, after the primary tank and then... Well, so this is an on-site system, yeah. right? So it just yes. takes stuff from your holding tank, right? Oh, yeah. Which is going to be a really good problem. Yeah. Um, can you explain how so the patient here uh, in, in the room. Yeah. So if a person has a question. I should repeat the question. Okay. Yes. So we were a couple weeks ago talking about cyanobacteria, especially for the nurses. And, and I started talking about this nitrification you know, problem we have here. And he looked at me and he said, well, I guess, you know, Germans involved this, you know, Solved this problem almost 100 years ago. You just put sulfur into the into your wastewater as it goes into your leach fields. And I go, okay, I've never heard about that, but he swore by it. And, and you know, he just he, he tries and he gets comes out of your field. Is that is that well? There is a there is, there is an autotrophic uh, uh, nitrate reduction process mm -hmm. that that does operate with sulfur. Um, we actually found, uh, I had one student uh, who did a senior thesis and she found the uh, microbes responsible in this barrier. Of course, the barrier here gets inundated with uh, seawater, which has a lot of sulfate in it. So uh, not quite sure of all the implications, uh, but I think the primary process here is not that. Okay. Well, he was suggesting you do it at your home. You just have it, it's like adding chlorine to your pool. Yeah, well, it, when, you, when you're flushing stuff down, you have like a little instead of a chlorifier, with carbon, you just add sulfur to the wastewater. I think you still need to, yeah. I'm going to make it, you have a little more you want to show yeah. us, right? Why don't we go ahead and let you do okay. your story and then we'll finish. So this barrier has been installed now. It's about 120 feet long. This was the 
The middle photo shows the injection process. This is where it was located, Shorewood Drive. Um, and I'm just gonna show you one bit of data uh, from it. And that is, this is, they, they did two doses, a one-year dose, a two-year dose. The one-year dose did not seem to work all that well. We're not quite sure why. Uh, the two-year dose seemed to be pretty effective. So what you see here again is depth relative to mean sea level going from zero to, this is in feet now, 50 feet down. Um, and on the left-hand graph is oxygen level. And remember, in order to get denitrification, we have to have anaerobic conditions. So, and we get those anaerobic conditions when the microbes see enough carbon to use up all the oxygen in their respiration. And then now they're gonna to start to work on nitrate, which is the next best thing to live off of if you run out of oxygen. Um, and so you can see in the upper 20 feet or so, uh, we depleted this, the injection depleted the oxygen from somewhere between six to eight milligrams per liter to basically zero. Uh, and at, in the same depth zone, uh, we saw a reduction in the nitrate levels from on the order of five to 10 milligrams per liter to uh, zero. So it worked. Yeah. Could you explain the one year, two year dose? I've never heard that term. Well, so one of the questions that we wanted to, the water quality management and, the, and Matt wanted to address was how much oil do you have to inject? And how long, so it goes to the question of how long will things last? We know the wood chips can last at least 15 years. This oil, you're, you're making an injection, it's, a, it's coating the sand grains, but you don't have nearly the mass of carbon that you would have if you had a, a giant bed of wood chips. Uh, and so it will be exhausted, but we don't know how long it will take to exhaust it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm still waiting here about one year versus two years. Uh, twice as much. Well, I, I don't know the actual dose. Oh, it's not uh, continuous injection for two years. It's not a continuous. No, <clears throat> this is not a continuous. It's a, year. It's a one time. They go out there, <clears throat> stick the probe down, and inject, driving it deeper as they go, inject, 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 withdraw the probe, move on to the next hole. They do not leave in place injection wells. Okay, so if you want, if you run out, after three years, you got to go back and do it again, which is obviously a disadvantage. So, uh, you know, the, there is no perfect solution yet. Make sense? Um, the last, I think the last figure I wanted to put up here just to show that I think we have made progress. When I started this, there was not any interest in PRBs that I was aware of on Cape Cod. Now the commission, the Cape Cod Commission, the EPA have put together a map showing where topography and you know conditions might be appropriate, groundwater flow and so forth from regional models might be appropriate so that a PRB ought to be considered. And all of these red uh, symbols uh, show those areas on the Cape that have been identified. Now, in order to actually do this in, in any one of these locations, I think it's critical that you go before you do any digging or any, uh, buy any wood chips or oil, um, do some ground truthing, go out there, see what direction groundwater is truly flowing because there's a lot of heterogeneity in there. Um, see what the nutrient levels are in the groundwater. Um, there are some tricks that people could use to identify hotspots. One of them is thermal imaging. <clears throat> you can fly in, if you go in August at low tide, you can fly over these water bodies and cooler groundwater shows up very nicely if you do thermal imaging. And you can do this with a drone and see where's all the groundwater entering. And then go to those locations, measure nitrates, see what you're looking at. That might be where you want to put your PRV because we're probably not going to align the entire shoreline with the others. Um, 
And that is the last slide. So I'm happy to entertain questions. And um, we also have, uh, well, maybe we'll let Lori do a question first from the chat box uh, in Zoom and then we can- Sure, we questions. just have one question so far in the chat box. Gotcha, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, if, tra if travel times are not one foot per day, in really two feet per day, what's the impact? So the question is, <clears throat> if travel times are not one foot per day, but two feet per day, what's the impact? And that's the reason it's so important to get the actual uh, reaction rates, the kinetics, if you will, uh, which is why experiments like the one we did in Wareham were useful, because we know how much removal per hour we can get at a given temperature. And that will help us size the, uh, the, the PRB. Uh, and there's, there, you're, the question is, is a very good one because there's a lot of variation in the flow rates. There's a lot of heterogeneity, even in our relatively uniform outwash plane in uh, the type of sediment there. And, and that's really what controls it. If it's a coarser, gravelly, or coarse sand material, water will flow much faster than if it's a very fine sand or clay. In fact, one of the things that came out of the PRB work that Matt was doing uh, at Sherwood Road was uh, in the deeper layers, there wasn't much groundwater movement and they thought there was going to be more. So the flow rates were about a 10th, I think, of what they expected. Uh, which meant that the mass removal rates were, ten, you know, you can get rid of 100% of the nitrogen, but if you're only flowing a little tiny bit of it through the, you know, in a, on a mass basis, mass per unit time, uh, you're not achieving a whole lot in terms of the load, load reduction. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's an important question and it works both ways. <clears throat> if you have higher flow rates and get rid of all the nitrogen, you get rid of a greater mass of nitrogen compared to low flow rates. But if you flow too fast and you don't can't react at all, then you have a problem. Does that make sense? All right, we'll take one in this room and then we've got another from the chat. Okay. <laughs> well, Deer, I Deer Island is only secondarily treated, I think. Uh, so a lot comes out of Deer Island. <laughs> <laughs> but our wastewater plant in, in Falmouth is, is permitted for three milligrams per liter or about 210 micromole. Uh, a lot of that nitrogen is organic end. So that, you know, that is not gonna be removed by the barrier. So it's form, the form of nitrogen matters quite a bit. We did some experiments with the water at the Wareham plant where we took the water coming out of the barrier, out of the uh, reactors, the old wood, the new wood, and from the, from the outflow trench, unaltered. And we added it to seawater and uh, sort of 50-50 mix and saw what the algal growth response was because the seawater all contained natural phytoplankton communities. And we found, uh, even though there was still about one and a half milligrams per liter of total nitrogen in that uh, water coming out of the reactors, um, almost no growth in the new wood uh, water. Uh, it was um, very similar to adding deionized water to seawater. Um, in the old wood, we got a little bit of response and in the outflow trench, we got a very large growth response. Uh, and then we were also able to look at, by adding back additional nutrients, whether it was nitrogen or phosphorus limited. So that was a very neat result that we got, but we did try to address that, that question of, okay, we're treating this stuff. It's coming out of the bioreactors. Um, the, the real question is once it enters the estuary, what happens? And it almost looked like that fresh wood had something that inhibited algal growth. There's really a lot of questions about that that need to be answered. We're, uh, I think more experiments should be done uh, with, that, with that result. Here's another uh, chat box question. 
Um, how did you decide how thick the wood chip barrier would be? Well, we collaborated with an engineer, Bill Lombardo, and with Will Robertson, who, uh, as I mentioned, was at the University of Waterloo. He was a groundwater guy who actually stumbled across this. And the way they, they stumbled across it was uh, they were tracking the plumes from septic systems uh, in Ontario. And they noticed these plumes suddenly disappeared and they dug up the sediments there mm -hmm. and soils there. And lo and behold, they were really organic rich. And they said, oh, well, we could artificially do this by adding back wood. So that's what kind of led them to think about that. The way I discovered this was we were working as part of the Land Margin Ecosystem Project on nutrient issues in Wakoit Bay. I was a postdoc at that point in time and with Ivan Valiella. And we, of course, were uh, pretty jazzed about the importance of groundwater flow uh, to contributing to this problem. The best people in groundwater were at Waterloo. So we made a trip up there and started talking to them. And uh, they, uh, explained this exciting result to us. Uh, we came back later on the, uh, I think I was the planning board representative to the, uh, to the, to the group appointed to figure out what to do with the money from the Air Force to remediate nutrient inputs. And I said, well, why don't we try, a PO came, PO Lombardo came and said, why don't we, let's put in a reactive barrier. That ended up not being done. And later there was a funding opportunity through uh, the coastal, uh, what is it, coastal estuarine environment, site seat, whatever site seat sta stands for. Uh, uh, we, we got the money to try this test barrier. So that's the story. So we yep. have about, uh, about five minutes left. So, and just Lori, there's no more questions in the chat. Just, just. Oh, you're here? Oh, you're here. So um, if there's, because like, I think we can also, you know. Uh, okay. I'd say at the moment, depth is, is the primary factor. Um, between wood chips and oil. Um, and, you know, probably disturbance to the site is another issue. Um, if you're going to do this any distance from the shore, EVO seems to be the strategy that people want to do. Uh, in fact, uh, DEP will not let you inject the oil within, I think, 100 feet of the shore. So that's because they're worried about breakthrough, which makes sense. Um, what was the second part of that question? Mixing the two. Mixing the two. Uh, I have thought about the possibility of mixing the two if you get uh, depletion in one that uh, the other could kind of help. Yeah, I have thought about that, but I don't think anyone's tried it. No. But there's someone who hasn't had a chance yet. Um, what steps can be taken to actually implement, you know, because one of the great things about this research is that it could decouple treatment from the sewers. If, you know, right now we're in this west to east um, right. mindset because of the cost and where the source started. And Nashville has the same thing. They're going yeah. east to west. So what could be actually take to well, I think that my own thinking is that we need to sort of do it in steps. We need to find uh, a few locations where we can try it at a somewhat larger scale. And then what are the issues? You know, in terms of cost of in installation, um, site characteristics, all the rest. And then if that works, we could keep scaling it up. There, there might be some issues with permitting, uh, acceptance of it by DEP. 
there certainly are issues with disturbing the coastal zone. Um, I'm actually going to turn that around and ask Ray Jack, who is, was our, you were, you were the guy who was in charge of uh, all of, you know, DPW for Falmouth. What do you think? I, I think, uh, and I spent 20, 25 years in Falmouth, uh, 30 years on Cape Cod, and presently um, assisting Mashpee with uh, some of the wastewater issues there. Uh, but managed these plants was responsible for the upgrade of uh, SBRs, sequencing batch reactors. I think the reality for Cape Cod has to be there is no singular approach. Right? It's going to be uh, a conglomeration of efforts and technologies uh, that are ultimately going to achieve success. This particular program here was very successful on what they what Ken showed tonight. Uh, down on Seaco shores, uh, even here at Lockaway Bay. I think the statistics speak for themselves. Uh, the only thing I, I would caution some people to think about is that you still need to shut off the path. Okay, when you have a contamination problem or issue, as long as it continues, then you will continue to have to deal with it on the receiving end of one reshape. So where do you do it? How do you do it? It's not cheap. All of these things cost money. And I think that's where the struggle is going to come in, that this is going to be a lot for Cape Cod communities to take on uh, financially, socially, politically, uh, regulatorily, across the board. And there is a need for new ideas uh, such as this uh, in order to be able to actually make an effect. The bottom line is for taking care of the issue, whatever the contaminants uh, may be, there's a dollar value associated with it. In the end, that the communities have to pay. All right. If if Ken stood up here and said all this is free, everybody would be banging on the door tomorrow. <laughs> okay, but it's not. All right. It costs money. It takes effort. Um, but I think it was. I think this program is good. So, oh, just a real. Oh, so, you know, as everybody in this room knows, the town of Falmouth has to make some choices. You mandated very quickly. We're going to go sewering right before we're going to get into, you know, we've got 30 years um, if we start managing watersheds. It sounds to me like your work with very positive results we've seen here would certainly argue for we better start going to the longer term solution to see how we can apply this stuff rather than just being forced into $200 million worth of, of sewering, right? I mean, that's what I'm seeing here is we have alternate needs and we've got to make the right choice on what we want to use the town. Is that a fair question? Well yeah I, I mean I, I think you know um I have learned that there's the science and then there's the politics and the economics and it's not a doesn't all one thing does not make this successful. You need a combination of people and uh strategies to make it work. I mean I when this first Data first came out, I thought, oh, simple. We're just going to align Seacoast Shores. That'll be straightforward, right? Um, I still wonder if we couldn't go along Edgewater Drive, for example, and put in wood columns and what the effect would be. But I wouldn't be ready to do that tomorrow. I think there'd have to be quite a bit of study to on a small scale uh, to sort of get ready to do it. I was just, just going to, uh, again, bring up uh, George Hortelder's layer cake, which is putting the wood chips over the leach field. So, uh, you know, your leach field becomes uh, a PRB. That might be, and I think that will be less expensive than putting sewers, especially through what point village and, and this area, which the town isn't even pro projecting at this point. Uh, so uh, that might be a way that we can do that. All right. So under the leash, under the leash.
But I, I think one issue that, that they have found is that if those wood chips do not remain saturated, uh, they, it doesn't work. And so that's been part of the problem. Um, and uh, a key thing with these, with these barriers and these reactors has been the size of these wood chips. You cannot just take uh, a, a mishmash of stuff that's from very fine to coarse. You have to screen out all the fines because they clog up the system. So you have to have, uh, and this is something that Will Robertson emphasized when we were doing this, our wood chips are, they're like, you know, two or three inches uh, long. They're maybe half inch wide. They're, you know, they're coarse material that got packed in there. And when I dig them up today, they're still pretty much intact but they allow rapid flow. Its surface area is important, but wood itself has enough surface area. It seems to work. So I'm going to suggest that we can kind of uh, wrap it up, but if people have more questions in the room, is that all right? If sure. Still? And I just as long as I get a cookie. Yeah, but <laughs> save a cookie for Ken. And, um, and I just want to, that was excellent. Well, thank you all for coming. And Thank you out there.